We are here for Reflections on Black History Month. This is yet another one of our Cultural Proficiency Speaker Series speakers. Uh, I, like everyone in Kirksville, probably is so proud to uh, know Dr. John Thurman. Uh, his record speaks for itself. Uh, when I arrived, he was uh, very ingratiating and welcoming me to the community. Uh, and he is that kind of person that is uh, um, the kind of DO that we say we want out in the workforce. He's in primary care. Uh, he is working in Iowa. He'll tell you more about his background. Uh, I will tell you this. Uh, I think more of our pre-health uh, and our current students should connect with folks like Dr. Thurman um, because he is the epitome of what it is from my perspective to be an AT Steel graduate. Uh, so I want to thank him for taking time out of his schedule, he and his lovely wife, Audrey, who's here with him, uh, to travel down to Kirksville, come home, and talk to us about his reflections relative not just Black History Month, but also uh, the career uh, in general, uh, the healthcare uh, environment in general. So please join me in uh, welcoming uh, Dr. Thurman uh, here today. Very cool. The general sentiment of mankind is that a man who will not fight for himself when he has the means of doing so is not worth being fought for by others. And this sentiment is just. For a man who does not value freedom for himself will never value it for others or put himself to any inconvenience to gain it for others. Such a man, the world says, may lay down until he has sense enough to stand up. It is useless and cruel to put a man on his legs if the next moment his head is to be bought against a curbstone. A man of that type will never lay the world under any obligation to him, but will be a moral pauper, a drag on the wheels of society. And it he too be identified with a peculiar variety of the raid, he will entail disgrace upon his race as well as upon himself. The world in which we live is very accommodating to all sorts of people. It will cooperate with them in any measure which they pro propose. It will help those who earnestly help themselves and will hinder those who hinder themselves. Who would be free themselves must strike the blow. Let me give you a word of the philosophy of reform. The whole history of the progress of human liberty shows that all concessions yet made to her august claims have been born of earnest struggle. The conflict has been exciting, agitating, all absorbing, and for the time being, putting all other tumults to silences. It must do this or it does nothing. If there is no struggle, there is no progress. Those who profess to favor freedom and yet deprecate agitation are men who want crops without plowing up the ground. They want rain without thunder and lightning. They want the ocean without the awful roar of its many waters. This was Frederick Douglass on August 3rd, 1857. He delivered a speech called the West India Emancipation in New York State. It was the 23rd anniversary of the event. If there is no struggle, there is no progress. This statement serves as the basis for progress in my life. This statement serves as the basis for Black History Month. This statement serves as the basis for Dr. King's life and legacy. I believe that this statement also stands as a testament to why we are all here. In effect, Andrew Taylor still did not simply hope to start a school of osteopathy. This took much toil, struggle, tragedy before a dream was realized. What would he think of the Kirksville College of Osteopathic Medicine that has now grown into A.T. Steele University, which is one of the most recognizable names in healthcare as well as academia? My mission here is to provide reflections of Black History Month. My speech will be in two parts. First part will provide reflections on the origins of black history and the narratives of people whom have been lost to the echoes of history. Second part will follow my own path and my own struggles to make it up onto this podium today. So I thank you all for giving me this opportunity to speak today. I had a very dedicated and focused speech that I was going to present and life happened earlier this week, forced me to change this speech, so I, I literally changed it last night. 
First, I would like to thank Audrey, my dear wife, who's sitting there next to Lori Haxton, for being here. Thank her for the four surgeries in two years that she endured, for being patient with me that one day that I told her that I was going to go to med school at the tender age of 28. Thank her for also being patient with me as we've lived in six different states over the last 15 years. You've been there through it all, and when you continue to ride this amazing journey in life, I'd like to thank my mom and my dad and my sister, who is clearly online, following right now, Tamika. <laughs> Hi, Tamika. <laughs> Hi. One of the major reasons I scrapped my speech is that one of my mom's siblings passed away just Wednesday. And the, the circumstances are, are interesting. Her husband actually passed away two weeks ago. And so my mom uh, is the youngest of 15. And so now there are seven siblings remaining. So my aunt on Wednesday was actually had complained of having some chest pain just on Tuesday. Went to our doctor, had an EKG, everything was normal. And she was watching her one and two year old granddaughters on Wednesday morning. And one of my cousins went and tried to get in the house and they couldn't. And EMS was called. They were able to get in the house and they found her. So just thinking about my aunt, thinking about my family, thinking about my mom being one of 15, and it makes me think of my grandmother who had the 15 children. And so when I think of black history, I feel that my family is black history. They're black present. And when my grandmother passed away in 1998, so she was born in 1914, at the time of her passing, she had 15 children, 57 grandchildren, so I had 55 first cousins, 108 great-grandchildren, and eight great-great-grandchildren, so that was in 1998. So I, you know, <laughs> I don't know where that number goes. So as an aside, we did not have family reunions at people's homes. We rented out convention halls for weekend events. Ask Audrey, she's been to them. Their story in part has inspired me to change my narrative today. I'm traveling to Texas tomorrow to be with some of my members of family to celebrate my aunt. I'd also like to thank Clint Normore for his friendship and mentorship. I'm a board member of the Kirksville Osteopathic Alumni Association. He came last April and delivered an impassioned speech about inclusion and diversity and what his mission is here at A.T. Still University. His delivery, his speech was so moving that a couple of other board members and myself actually started an endowment for the inclusion and diversity program to help with minorities. So I, I wanted to thank Clint for all of his leadership and what he's meant to me as well. I'd like to thank A.T. Steele University President Craig Phelps, KCM Dean Mark, Ma Maggie Wilson, my good friend, members of the board of directors, members of the board of directors from the Kirksville Osteopathic Alumni Association Board, Distinguished faculty and that I get to see that are friends and most importantly the students who decided to come out and share a few minutes with me Thank you for all having me. It's great to be back So with that, I'm going to delve into this bear with me. This this needs to be This 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 will make sense. So Sails furled flag drooping at her rounded stern. She rode the tide in from the sea She was a strange ship indeed by all accounts a frightening ship a ship of mystery. Whether she was traitor, privateer, or man of war, no one knows. Through her bulwarks, black mouth cannon yawned. The flag she flew was Dutch. Her crew was a motley. Her port of call, an English settlement, Jamestown, in the colony of Virginia. She came, she traded, and shortly afterwards was gone. Probably no ship in modern history has carried a more portentous fright. freight. Her cargo? 20 slaves. The scary fact is from the trade's beginning in the 16th century to its conclusion in the 19th, slave merchants brought the vast majority of enslaved Africans to two places, the Caribbean and Brazil. Of the more than 10 million enslaved Africans to eventually reach the Western Hemisphere, just 388,000, less than 4% of the total, came to North America. Slavery itself was an intricate and powerful system of control that the slave owners developed to maintain their labor supply and way of life, a system both subtle and cruel, involving every device that social orders employ for keeping power and wealth where it is. So uh, there's some interesting stories as you're, you're, you're trying to reflect on this. And so my theme is looking at progress and struggle. And there's a particular story that is told about a group of 
enslaved Africans that came over and actually staged a revolt. And they were actually able to take over the boat. There were 75 of them. It's called the Igbo landings. And this happened in, I believe it was 1809. And they were able to take over the boat and take over the crew. And they knew that they were being forced into slavery. Instead of being forced into slavery, they made the decision as a group to basically, this is one of the first mass suicides in history. So they actually were uh, people that were there. There was a couple of individuals that were able to give eyewitness accounts to this that stated that they were singing songs and they started marching into the swamp and led by their high chief. And at his direction, they walked into the Dunbar Creek committing suicide. There were many bodies that were recovered. Uh, some took their own lives. Um, but I think that was not really which was the big, the big tale of the story. The, the tale is that rather than remain enslaved, they wanted to be free in the new world. Gradually, their sacrifice took an enormous symbolic importance in local African-American folklore. I, th I, I reflect upon that story as just something that's interesting that's in history that's not necessarily taught in the textbooks. Second story is about a gentleman named Hiram Rhodes Rebels. Hiram Rhodes Rebels. There have been 10 African-American United States senators in our history, and this gentleman was the first. His story is fascinating because he was born to free persons. His parents were both free and they had migrated to the South to try to get educated and he was turned away. So they actually ended up moving up into Indiana and in Illinois in order to complete his education and training. Seems like he was a very gifted orator and actually would become a central part of the Civil War in terms of getting together black regiments. He actually helped to formulate two black regiments. And during that time, he actually became one of the chaplain for one of the units during the Civil War. And after that, he kind of somehow got ushered into politics. And it was just, he was a man that was, it seems like he was a man that was just. He believed in equality of all. And he kind of, he gave this great speech when they were needing a senator to replace um, a, a gentleman by the name of Jefferson Davis. And someone said, this gentleman is gonna be the next United States Senator. And so he goes up and gets selected, but he is not recognized by the body. The Democrats, so he's a Republican. So the Democrats do not want to seat him. So there becomes this huge uh, blocking of this gentleman being seated to join the United States Senate. And eventually after much deliberations, they vote on it. The Republicans vote 48 to eight. He gets elected and he serves in the United States Senate for about a year and a half. And then he went on to a life to become a, to run a, a school and some other things like that. But just thinking about where this man came from and having to go through all those things to become the first African-American state senator, I think that's just something worthy of, of remembering. Moreover, without struggle, there's no progress. I think of a gentleman by the name of Kudjo Lewis. He is the second to last known survivor of the Atlantic slave trade between Africa and the United States. Passed away in 1935. Together with 115 other African captives, he was brought illegally to the United States on board the ship Clotilda in 1860. He was only 19 when he was captured by a neighboring tribe who then sold him off into slavery. Because the slave trade was illegal, his captors snuck him and other survivors into Alabama at night and made them hide in a swamp for several days. They burned the boat so they could burn all of the evidence. And then he would actually go on to provide firsthand accounts about what it was like to travel, what it was like to be a slave and come to a plantation not knowing any of the language and, and trying to interact and, and be a part of the society. So after the Civil War came, Union soldiers came and said, you're free. And so they thought, well, we were promised that we would get some form of reparations that didn't happen. So instead of getting mad and frustrated, a group from the Clotilda decided to get together and band and, and save their money and be able to purchase land. And they did this. And they actually bought a couple of acres of land and, and established a community outside of Mobile, Alabama that they called Africa Town. And they actually formed their own institutions with a little local government a church, a cemetery, 
and this became a way of life for these individuals. As he acquired more years on the planet, which is what I say to my patients as they get older, they, <laughs> he became more of a historian and a storyteller, so people would, would go to him to learn about all of this because all of the people from the slave trade were dying, so they were trying to get these firsthand accounts. So he's a person, I think, that is something worthy of remembering from, the, uh, from Black History Month. So the first, slaves to sh the first slave ships to land in America, the first slave uprising, the first African-American United States Senator, the second to last known survivor of the Atlantic slave trade, this is black history. I talked earlier about my family being black history, black present. What is the history of Black History Month? Does it start with Dr. King or is it something else? There's a gentleman by the name of Carter G. Woodson. Very interesting gentleman. He was an historian. And he was born to parents who did not have an education. He himself did not have an education and actually would get sporadic schooling as he worked in coal mines as a young person and worked on farms. Eventually, he would get to high school in his 20s, graduate, would go abroad to get a university degree, and would eventually end up getting a doctorate in history at Harvard. So history was his background, and this became what he was focused on. And more importantly, he was focused on black history having a foothold and, and not being forgotten. And so he worked really hard to form his associations in which they actually established the Black History Week. And then eventually, after weeks and months and years and toils and trying to make sure that people maintained a focus on this, uh, this Black History Week actually found a foothold. President Gerald Ford, actually started to acknowledge this in the 1970s. And eventually would the, on the, I think it was the, fifth, the 100th anniversary, the bicentennial of the country, decided that they would turn it into Black History Month. So it wasn't officially designation by Congress, but Black organization had done so. And so then in 1986 is when Congress signed into law Black History Month. But this was due to the efforts of this gentleman, Carter Woodson, back in 1915 when he first established Black History Week. That was just this little thing that he tried to show people like this was their history. They would have pageants and they would have different types of shows and effects like that. But they also wanted to show the artistry and wanted to show different things like that with respect to Black people and what their contributions were so that would not be lost. So this is kind of where I wanted to start my talk in acknowledgement of Black history. My grandmother's story, I feel, is unique to the Black experience. Fifteen children. They paved the path so that me and my sister could thrive and contribute. My mom attended a segregated school. My father attended a desegregated school, to which now I'm a member of its wall of honor, which is irony. My sister has thrived in her mission and philanthropic work. She's had to struggle. I've had to struggle. But I think this is where the story is going to take a little bit of a turn and I'm going to go to more present day. I'm a graduate of the military academy at West Point. I played football there and I had great big dreams and I thought I was going to do a lot of different things. And let's just say I got hit in the face really hard by reality when I got to West Point. Everyone that goes there is doing well in life. And so when you get into a sea like this, things are, are, are a little bit more challenging. I would say that I struggled mightily at West Point. I did end up playing four years there, but there were some moments when you start to doubt and you question yourself. So you start thinking about that statement that has started this, this whole talk. I found myself making the, a decision whether or not to continue playing football. You have to understand, so you know, I, I played high school football in the state of Texas and it's, you know, that's supposed to be a big deal. And <laughs> I was a quarterback. And so I wasn't a starter. So I had to make a decision. Was I going to be a junior or senior? And was I going to be a scout team player? Or was I going to quit and just go off and be a student? And I remember making the decision to stay on the football team as a senior or as a junior as a senior and serve as a role model for the freshmen and the sophomores to learn how to be a professional, learn how to contribute when you're not the starter to best prepare the team, to be something more than trying to be the star. And I'll tell you that experience is important because a lot of those guys today, Audrey can attest to that when they come up and they're just like, hey, there's, there's Johnny Thurm. I remember when you were, you know, a junior and you would talk to me as a freshman and 
your, your motivation and, and your example is something I still remember to this day. That was back in the late 90s. I would say moving forward, I think it's important to recognize that we can serve even when we think that service is not something that we're currently accustomed to. I graduated from the military academy and life was taking me to different roads. I ended up going to Fort Riley, Kansas, which is located outside of Manhattan, Kansas. Through the course of life, 9-11 happens. I'm sure you all remember where you were doing that day. We were actually getting ready for a deployment to the National Training Center, which is in California. This would lead me on different trajectory in life. So I would end up going to Kuwait in 2002 for a deployment. And then I would eventually end up going to Iraq in 2003 at the start of the, the war, Operation Iraqi Freedom. I would say unequivocally as one of the greatest challenges that I've faced in my life, but I think experiences there more than anything is crafted where I am today. I think Iraq represents a period of growth and discovery and determination for me. In order to understand me, you have to understand why my West Point lineage and my deployment to Baghdad, Iraq was so important. We had two missions while I was there. The first one was leading my platoon to a propane facility in Northwest Baghdad and provi providing security to that facility. Propane was, is the lifeline, so we've got gas, we've got electricity, they don't have that. Okay, propane was to fuel their homes and to keep their homes warm and to cook. So that was, once the government failed, you've got anarchy, so people are just coming and hoarding and stealing, so we were there to protect it so that people could just have their daily operations. I learned huge lessons of patience and understanding during this time, trying to work with the Iraqis. I worked pretty much as almost like an ambassador or attache with my Iraqi colleagues during that. However, one night we were enforcing curfews and we didn't want people to be out because there was threats of violence and we, you know, we didn't want people to be um, getting attacked. So we set up checkpoints. And this one particular evening, we actually ended up stopping about 20 to 25 Iraqi men, but we needed to get them to the jail. So lo and behold, there happened to be this 1970s era chartered bus that we stopped. So we're like, great, now we've got a bus. Now we can get everybody in the bus and we go and we can get them processed and things will be great. So it's me and three of my soldiers. So I'm like, all right guys, let's, let's, uh, let's take this bus and we'll have a, a convoy follow us to make sure that we're safe. No one knew how to drive the bus. This is in the 1970s, this is 2002, 2003. And it's a stick shift chartered bus. So if you can imagine the scene, you've got a bunch of people speaking Arabic in the back yelling at us. You got three of soldiers and myself and it's just this surreal situation. So I'm like, okay, I guess I will drive as the lieutenant. So I drove the 1970s era chartered bus to jail with my Iraqi prisoners. So I don't know if you know about struggling. I mean, this is one of those situations where things could really, really, really go bad if upset people are not very happy. But anyway, not a far cry from that. We were able to make it to the jail and they were able to get processed and everything was fine. The big moment that really occurred while I was deployed that changed a lot of things for me was my unit then got a mission change and we were to go down to a hospital in downtown Baghdad. It's called the El Yarmouk Hospital. I'll never forget it. Uh, it was one of those situations I remember after we had been there for a few days, my major came to visit us to check and see how we were doing. And he had remarked that all of you guys are going to need to get counseling. You're, you're going to need mental health counseling for all of the things that you're seeing and experiencing because of what was coming through the emergency room or, or what was coming through the morgue. <clears throat> I remember one day we were coming through and the power would go out routinely and you could never predict when the power would go in and out. And I remember a young Iraqi boy, probably eight or nine. Yes, yeah, sir. I had an interpreter with me. I was like, sir can you please turn the power on? My uncle's in the middle of surgery. And, and I, I just remember thinking, well, there's, there's nothing I can do about the power. But those are some of the experiences that we had. I remember one particular incident where we were also, this was before, I'm sure you've heard of improvised explosive devices, <coughs> IEDs. I had one brought to my front door 
um, escorted by one of my soldiers. This is before it was a thing. But they found, uh, an Iraqi man had found this big round that was sitting on the ground and it had like a, like a little clock mechanism tied into the nose cone of it. And so my soldier helped him bring it to our front desk door and be like, sir, look what we found. And I'm thinking, oh, that's great. So I just put on my Kevlar helmet and just sat down on my bed and waited for it to explode because I was like, this is insane. Why did he bring this to my front door? <laughs> but nonetheless, we, we brought the uh, EOD, the explosive ordinance. It's, the detachment came out and they disarmed it. Then it happened. One afternoon, young girl, schooled girl named Fatma. She's walking home from school with her backpack, speeding down the road, and then this little Toyota truck comes around and hits her. Her family gets her to our emergency room. There seemed to be an urgency. I remember it just being just a very chaotic day in the emergency room, and life was, was very explosive at that particular point in time in El Yarmouk. And there was just something that drew me to this young lady and her story, and I could just like see the family surrounding and the doctors were trying to stabilize her. You know, I, I was a lay person at the time, but I was like, it looks like she's obviously got some broken ribs. It's like her leg is broken and she looks like she's in a lot of pain. From what I could gather, my interpreter figured out that it looked like she needed to be transferred to a hospital that had a breathing machine or a respirator. So they were there, I believe for two nights and I, I, the, the family would be there with her, so I, I would try to gather up any food that I could and share it with them. I had some prayer beads that I'd obtained in Kuwait in 2002, and I would, I would just sit there with them. And I can't explain why I would spend time with this young girl and her family. I, I've got photos of it. Uh, I just, there just felt like there's this need, and I'll, and I'll never forget one of my soldiers, his name's Eric Deerheimer, and he said, Sir, he's like, why are you spending so much time with this, with this family? And I, and I couldn't answer him. And finally, on night three, hospital bed, uh, they were able to dispatch an ambulance to come. A, a, a respirator had opened up. They needed me to sign off on some paperwork for her to get transferred because it was after curfew. So I signed off the paperwork, and everyone's happy, and she went off. And I think that she did okay. About a week later, granddad came back to the hospital and he wanted to, to thank me for my assistance, wanted to thank me for the help in getting his granddaughter off to the other hospital. And he said, can you do me one more thing though? It's like, can you sign this paperwork so I can get my AK-47 back so I can protect my farm? <laughs> so I did, because that's what the farmers did. They didn't have donkeys or mules to help protect their livestock. But anyway, it was really good to see him. And I'll never forget, a couple of weeks after the whole experience, my interpreter, his, he called himself Joe. He said, something's different about you. You seem more hardened, more withdrawn. And I told him I, I couldn't explain it. I just, I had this sense of helplessness. And I actually think this is one of the moments that inspired me to revisit the idea of maybe pursuing medical school. So we'll fast forward that deployment ending. And I return back to the United States and I get transferred. My next duty station in the Army is back at West Point, which was something I really wanted to do. Audrey and I have met by this point and we're dating long distance and everything's going great. She's, she's, doing, she's in college, I'm working up at West Point. At some point we're gonna get married and you know, life is happy, but there would be a fateful day in which in the army there's a structure so you follow the command of your superiors and so i was working in the admissions department during minority admissions and you have to play different sports so there's flag football for the old people to play against the different departments and well the math department and the admissions department was playing ultimate frisbee and so my boss was like we don't have enough people captain thurman you're going to play today sir i don't want to play ultimate frisbee Captain Thurman, you're going to play Ultimate Frisbee. Sir. Yes, sir. So I go and I go run two miles to get warmed up. I get some cleats. I go down. I was like, oh, my gosh, we're playing the math department. We've got like four former football players on our team. I'm like, we're going to beat these guys. No big deal. <sighs> so lo and behold, little Frisbee's coming. And I'm thinking, oh, I can get that. And I, I miss time to jump, and I come down awkwardly. And I land on my leg extended and completely destroy my knee. I, it, it, I, so I suffered a posterior lateral corner 
injury. So basically like the LCL, the ACL, biceps, tendon, all this business was basically blown up. At one point in the emergency room, you know, your, your knee goes like this. <laughs> well, my knee was going this way. And so finally had to stop. I remember Audrey was in the emergency room, looked like she was gonna vomit. I think the, I think the PA was gonna vomit too. So that led to four surgeries in two years. Well, the injury was so significant that I actually had nerve damage and I had foot drop. So my, my foot didn't work. So 27 year old that's having to now go to Walter Reed. And I'll, I'll tell you that this was probably one of the more pivotal moments in my life and getting treatment down at Walter Reed Army Medical Center. And this is where I first encountered DOs. And Audrey, I thought, she, she explains the story a little bit better than I do, but she said, hey, there was something different about them. Like the residents came through, they, they asked me how I was doing, not just about how you were doing. And so I was like, huh, kind of that thing in the back of my head about medical school kind of popped into my head and I asked them about it and they said, hey, you know, if you're interested in looking into medical school, there's a book you should read. I'm like, well, what, what's the title of the book? And it's called, it's called D.O.'s. It's by this gentleman by the name of Norman Gevitz. I'm like, huh, all right, so I'll purchase it. So I, I purchased the book and kind of got me fired up. And I was like, you know what? I think I'm really going to look, look more into this. And I will tell you, I just, this is not getting too far off the theme, but I'll tell you about the, the courage of young people. So while we were getting treatments, I had to go to Walter Reed multiple times. There was one time Audrey and I were eating breakfast and there was a table of four soldiers that were amputees that were behind us. And I'll never forget one of the soldiers getting up and saying, hey, does anybody need any seconds or anything like that? And we turned and we looked over and it was a triple amputee. All he had was one arm. <sighs> yeah, and that was injured and he was asking to, to, so anyway. So I finished Dr. Gevitz's book and made the decision that I was gonna go to med school. So I come home one day and I tell my wife, I'm like, hey, Audrey, uh, I, I think I'm going to go to medical school. I think that's what I'm going to do with my life. I, obviously, this army thing's not going to keep going with four surgeries in two years. And she said, you're going to what? She was myth. She's like, you're going to get a second degree while I have yet to finish one? And I was like, ooh, no, I've got a plan. So there's this place. It's called Kirksville. We can go there and I can go to Kirksville to the, the osteopathic school and you can go to this place called Truman State. And she's like, okay, whatever. Eventually that all worked out. She was, she, she's, she's not so unhappy now. So we, we get to Kirksville, life is, life is great. Uh, we established all of these long-term friendships, but I would say that struggle, you know, without struggle, there's no progress. I would say that, do you guys still have Operation Osteopathic Service? No, that doesn't exist anymore. Okay. Well, there was a, a big earthquake that hit Haiti in January of 2010, and we were able to help raise some money to help send for those relief efforts. And as irony would have it, or how life tends to, 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 to shake this way, um, Audrey would actually end up volunteering with a group that goes to Haiti on a routine basis that serves this orphanage as well as a, as a medical clinic. And we've been able to work with them, this organization, to go back and forth to Haiti after the earthquakes, which has been a very life-changing thing. One of the coolest things that we did was we went out into one of the rural out areas in Jacmel in Haiti and set up a rural clinic at someone's house that I think was a, a minister. And we saw 50 patients in two hours. And it was amazing. Like People didn't really truly need medical care in some instances. They literally wanted to get multivitamins from us. Like children, all we had was children's multivitamins. And so we were able to get children's multivitamins and acid reflux medication because everyone's eating a spicy diet. So <clears throat> very cool things. And I would say those are very trying and stressful things. And I think this all leads into basically the theme of reflections on black history, ranging the spectrum of struggle and how that does lead to progress, right? So you can say you can't, have anything that doesn't come with some type of struggle, right? Steve Jobs didn't make Apple Apple just because he wanted it to be Apple. That took work, that took struggle. 
Michael Jordan was not the greatest basketball player because he was just gifted. He worked at it, he missed more shots than he made. Look at baseball players. You know, batting average is 300 is awesome, right? So I think Frederick Douglass's statement, without struggle, there's no progress, I think is a very, very worthy thing to carry with you through your life. I think of Dr. King. I think of my, my grandmother. We called her Big Mama. I think of people who gave so much. I think of us in the present who are working to pave a way to an, un, to an improved future. My own struggle. I was the class president of two different classes here at Kirksville. Why? Because I had to take an extra year because I struggled academically. After being out of school for seven years, going to Kuwait and Iraq, I academically was a little bit rusty. So it took me a little while. And I'm not afraid or ashamed of my own personal struggle here at Kirksville. Whether it was West Point showing me that medical school was a tough proposition or feeling helpless with Fatma and her family or having a bomb delivered to my front steps or to destroying my knee, I think perseverance and continuing to push ourselves in service of others is ultimately the message of Black History Month. If there's no struggle, there is no progress. I'd also like to add that not only am I practicing medicine in Iowa, I'm a family medicine physician, I'm also the hospice medical director. And that has been one of the great gifts and joy of my life to participate in that particular discipline and that part of life. So I think it's a very important part. So I'm going to leave you with two quotes and then I'll conclude this. First quote is, when you arise in the morning, think of what a precious privilege it is to be alive, to breathe, to think, to enjoy, to love. That's Marcus Aurelius. And the last one is me. Quote, take grasp of the cup of love and pour it out onto the spirit of life. Now, this is how we're going to end this. I'm going to make my mama and my family proud. We're all going to take a selfie so I can share this moment with them and send this back to Texas. Is that okay with y'all? <laughs> y'all all smile back there, okay? We'll get a couple of shots. Hey there. All right. Thank you all. <laughs> all right.